It's the 1995 Boxing Day Test at one of cricket's most hallowed venues. And in just a moment, Australian Sri Lankan sporting relations are about to take a turn for the worst. On day one, Australia are two wickets down, and for the first time ever, young Sri Lankan sensation Mutai Muralitharan will soon be bowling at the MCG. But the controversial incident that soon occurs doesn't come from Sri Lanka's opponents, but from the match officials themselves. As Murali delivers the ball down the wicket, umpire Daryl Hare signals a no ball and raises his arm. Murali bowls another one and he does it again. The commentators and spectators are perplexed. Murali clearly didn't overstep either crease. What's going on here? And then it sinks in. Daryl Hare is calling him for throwing. Even when Murali begins bowling from the other end and the other umpire doesn't follow Hare's lead, Daryl Hare then goes on to say that he'll start calling no balls on Murali from square leg. Now, we know in 2023 about the battles that Murali had to face throughout his entire career to show that his delivery was in fact legal. But back in 1995, this was the first time this had happened on the test cricket stage. And what made this situation even more volatile was that just one test earlier, Sri Lanka had been accused of ball tampering at the WACA, a charge that they were eventually cleared of. Australia won the test and the series 2-0, but the scars of that test series would stay with Sri Lanka for much longer. Sri Lanka and the cricket world of 1995 was, in some ways, much different to the cricket world that we have today. There was no T20 cricket, only one ball was used for each team during ODI matches, and the boundaries weren't brought in as much as they are today, even if that meant fielders having to contend with sight screens and concrete to field a ball. Batting was arguably more difficult as a result, and the scores were lower as well. The largest ODI score in history, as of today, is 498 scored by England against the Netherlands in 2022. But up until 96, the largest 50 over score was 360, and even that was an outlier. The 300 mark had only been crossed 24 times in a 50 over game up until that point, and was often seen as an almost unbeatable score. The Sri Lanka which we are perhaps used to, maybe even grew up watching, weren't at that level by 1995. In fact, although their passions and abilities on the field were obvious, even back then, the team, indeed the whole cricketing board, was of much humbler beginnings. The Sri Lankan cricket board couldn't afford to send their teams on international tours on their own, so it often have to seek outside funding from corporate sponsors along the way. It wasn't just overseas tours where things were tight. For instance, when Sri Lanka were trying to hire their new coach Dav Watmore and physio Alex Kantouris in 1995, they didn't have the money to afford them. It came out years later that the funds were sourced from the Australian cricket board, who had silently doubled the amount of money they gave Sri Lanka for their tour of Australia to hire them. A number of the national team players had separate day jobs to make a living, and many of them lived under the one roof in Captain Arjuna Ranatunga's family home. While Sri Lanka might not have had the state-of-the-art training facilities or sponsors knocking down their door, in living in close quarters for so long, they had organically created something that massive sports teams even today spend millions of dollars on, team spirit and a camaraderie within the squad. The scrutiny that they faced in Australia might have broken many a team, but this team didn't let it happen. And let's be straight here, we cannot confuse a lack of funds for a lack of cricketing ability. Sri Lanka's ODI side had the pieces to become one of the most successful in the world, but they couldn't do so copying another team. They couldn't follow the mould set by Sri Lankan teams of the past or from another country. They had to make their own. And we started to see that take shape in the triangular series of 1995-96 in Australia. It started at the top of the batting order. Sri Lanka by this time had already promoted Sanath Jayasuriya to the top of the order to great attacking effect. But they had often paired him with someone with a more measured approach, like Roshan Mahanama. This changed by the end of 1995 when they brought keeper Ramesh Kaluwathirana up to opener and gave the two a simple goal, attack from ball one. They put the opening bowlers who expected to be treated with respect from the batters on the back foot, like Ramesh did to Glenn McGrath right here. Sri Lanka's innings by extension would be off to a great start. Of course, it sometimes meant that an early wicket was on the cards, but then Sri Lanka would have a Sanka Gurusinghe and his defensive capabilities to stop a wider batting collapse. He could then try to anchor the innings and build a larger score as the middle order bats like Klasi Aravinda De Silva, Hashantela Karatna and Arjuna Ranatunga would come into the game. On the bowling side, Chaminda Vas would partner Pushpak Omara or Wickrama Singer to make use of any new ball swing. And as the game went on into the later overs, a procession of spin options, including Murali and Kumar Dharmasena, would slow the run rate right down and bring pressure onto the run chase. But there were two things that could really take this team over the top. First was the all-round capabilities of players like Jayasuriya and De Silva, 
whose spin bowling gave them so much flexibility. But second and most importantly was the captain, Arjuna Ranatunga. This was the guy who stood side by side with Murali in the Boxing Day test as the eyes of the world were on him, who stood down from no challenge and had one of the greatest cricketing minds at the time. His work with coach Dav Watmore added Dav's analytical prowess and game planning with Arjuna's ability to not only motivate these men with different personalities, but to distill each player's role into its simplest form and collectively create a plan of attack. This is what built the foundation of what could be a successful team. As they left the shores of Australia to go home, they might not have won that series, but a much bigger prize was on the horizon. Glenn McGrath once again getting the danger man and getting him. Following the Australia tour, Sri Lanka would co-host the 1996 ODI World Cup with Pakistan and India, and their opening match would be against Australia. Unfortunately, events off the pitch would change things dramatically. On the 31st of January, a truck filled with explosives would crash through the gates of Sri Lanka's central bank in Colombo before being detonated and a group of attackers linked to the LTTE, better known as the Tamil Tigers, opened fire, killing 91 people and injuring over a thousand. This was only 17 days before Sri Lanka's opening match in Colombo and it raised massive questions for Australia. Is it safe enough to travel to Sri Lanka? Even after all these years later, it's really hard to say if there's a right or wrong answer to a question like that. Sri Lanka and their government did their best to make the situation as secure as possible in the aftermath of that incident. But Australia made their own assessment and decided against travelling there, instead choosing to forfeit the match and stay in Mumbai. The West Indies would eventually follow suit as well, forfeiting their match to Sri Lanka later in the group stage. It's only natural how Sri Lanka could see this as an affront to their country. Australia was indirectly saying that Sri Lanka was too dangerous to travel to. On one level, the negative political aspects of this shine through. However, on another, this left the Sri Lankan cricket team in a very fortunate position. Without a ball being bowled, Sri Lanka had earned four points against two of the strongest teams in the tournament. Their remaining matches would be against local rival India, Zimbabwe and Kenya. They probably only needed one more win to qualify for the next phase. And through all of this, it was Ranatunga, perhaps more than anyone else, who saw what these circumstances could create in the biggest scheme of things. How, in the face of such adversity, from cricketing officials calling no balls, to people saying his country was too unsafe to play in, there could be a way to unite his country behind his team and turn what had been a negative into a positive. And with six words, he created a rallying cry that a nation would get behind. We want Australia in the final. It wasn't until the 21st of February 1996 for Sri Lanka to play their first game against Zimbabwe in Colombo. Restricting Zimbabwe to 228 runs for their 50 overs, Sri Lanka's Guru Singer and Aravinda De Silva showed their importance in a match-defining innings. Combining together for 15 fours and 8 sixes, ending with a 172 run partnership. At the time, it was Sri Lanka's highest ever ODI partnership for any wicket. They were finally both dismissed with Sri Lanka at 4 for 209, but the rest was plain sailing. Sri Lanka reached the total with 13 overs to spare and in the process, put a marker down for the rest of the competition. With this win and the two forfeits, Sri Lanka were through to the next round. But this wasn't a time for Sri Lanka to take the foot off the throttle. They had India coming up next, in Delhi. The older Indian fans amongst us might remember this match for the runner ball 137 runs that Sachin Tendulkar scored, which included some awesome late hitting, towards a score of 271 runs. For six, it's over. It just kept going and going and going. But for many, this match is remembered for Sri Lanka's run chase. Jayasuriya and Kaluathana attacked like their lives depended on it, silencing the home crowd. Manoj Prabhakar, in particular, was in Sri Lanka's sights. He tried everything he could, going over the wicket, around the wicket, short, full, all of it went to the boundary. 33 runs off his first two overs. The batters mixed power with precision and a deft touch. Even Kaluathana getting out didn't stop the attack. It takes three wickets falling in succession, a sloppy piece of running followed by Jayasuri caught in the deep, and a bit of magic from Anil Kumble to give India a chance of getting back in the game. The equation was 131 runs of 162 balls, but some of India's bowlers were already rattled from the early onslaught. In particular, Prabhakar. So much so that when he comes back into the attack in the middle overs, he starts bowling off spin, and that still doesn't stop him from getting the same treatment. Ranatunga and Tilakaratna combined to calmly chase down the total, and with a final bit of help from India's fielders, Sri Lanka win the match with eight balls to spare. And that's the ball game. Tremendous win by Sri Lanka. 
Okay, beating that Zimbabwean team is one thing, but beating India in the manner they did in India got people's attention. And then to put an exclamation mark on all of it, in their final match of the group phase, they set a world record score against Kenya. The top five all get in on the action, underlined by De Silva scoring 145 runs. They win by 144 runs and finish the group phase on top with 10 points. The tornado that is now the Sri Lankan cricket team heads into the finals as the informed team of the tournament. The quarterfinals would see Sri Lanka play England in Faisalabad, Pakistan. On a spongy and slow wicket, England won the toss and batted first. As they batted, it seemed like England couldn't get out of first gear with a number of batters getting a start before being dismissed. Sri Lanka's spin bowlers came to the fore, getting six wickets between them. Phil de Freitas and a wagging tail pushed England to 235 after 50. In response, England had an early breakthrough, opening the bowling with spin and getting Kaluatharana out cheaply. But after they dropped a catch here, Jayasuriya went to work and shot by shot dismantled any English hope that Sri Lanka would have similar troubles on the pitch. Nothing seemed to be going England's way. Jayasuriya and Gurusinghe combined for a 100-run partnership before Sanath is stumped for 82. This was an opening, but look at the scoreboard. Sri Lanka was almost halfway to England's score already, and they'd only faced 13 odd overs, with eight batters still to come. Sri Lanka's approach had again proven why it was so successful. Sri Lanka's middle order could take a steady approach, afford a few dismissals, and still get to the total in the end. That's a good shot. Right to the gap. And what a comprehensive victory. Sri Lanka advanced to the semi-final, where they would face a familiar foe. But that game was unlike any other game that they had played in in that World Cup. And perhaps unlike any one-day international that you've ever seen. The 1996 World Cup's first semi-final was between Sri Lanka and India, played at Eden Gardens in Kolkata. As we saw earlier, Sri Lanka had beaten India in Delhi in the group stage but the semi-finals is when the pressure is really on. And India showed early on that day that they had learnt a thing or two from their earlier encounter. In addition to a slip fielder, India placed a fielder a third man from ball one. And just look what happened when Kalu Atharana faced his first ball. And then Jaya Surya. Oh, that's gone to third man. This could be out as well. He's got him. It's unbelievable. Sri Lanka's twin wrecking balls were back in the sheds within the first over. Guru Singer followed them shortly afterwards as Javagal Srinath gets his third. And at 3 for 35, Sri Lanka have a top order collapse on their hands. India was no doubt on top, but there was plenty of time left. Aravinda De Silva's powerful 66 off 47 brought his team back into the game. But it was the innings of Roshan Mahanama that underpinned the fight back. Soaking up a quarter of Sri Lanka's innings on his own, his 58 of 101 balls allowed De Silva and Ranatunga to attack from the other end. And when he was forced off the field due to injury, it was left to Tilakaratna, Chaminda Vas and the tail to get as many runs as possible. They managed to somehow bat the 50 overs and from 3 for 35 at one stage, put 251 runs on the board. A pretty competitive score. Oh, what a magnificently timed shot by Chaminda Vas. In this cathedral of cricket, bathed in bright light, India's equation for victory was 252 runs or 50 overs. This was a situation perfectly set up for a Sachin Tendulkar masterclass. He races out of the blocks, hitting all comers to all sides of the ground, bringing up his 50 in the 16th over. Sri Lanka's team set up for these conditions though, with four spin options. And while Tendulkar was flying, his partners weren't getting in on the party. This fact struck home in the 22nd over when this happened. He's got him, yes he's got him, I'm sure he's out. This could be a vital wicket. After scoring 65 of 88 deliveries, India's little master was dismissed. On the face of things, Sachin was a big loss, but India was still in a decent position. Two for 98 with 154 needed off 140 balls. However, Sachin's wicket meant so much more than that. Such was the importance of Sachin Tendulkar in that side that when he got out, it felt like one wicket would turn into a batting collapse. Indian fans had seen it time and time again. Only this time, it would be in a semi-final of a World Cup at home. And any optimism that was in the crowd up until that point evaporated in an instant as wickets began falling, one after another after another. Two for 98 became eight for 120 and things off the field would deteriorate fast. Parts of the crowd had seen enough and projectiles began being thrown on the pitch while fires were lit in the stands. Things were getting out of hand. 
the police were called in to try and stop it as the match was put on hold. In the end, even after trying to restart the game a second time, the game was eventually called off and Sri Lanka won by default. A sporting spectacle that was sadly overshadowed in a very unfortunate way. As March 14th became the 15th, the turbulence of the night before made way for something much more profound. Arjuna Ranatunga, his team and the nation of Sri Lanka were one win away from World Cup glory. And the one team standing in their way? Australia. The Gaddafi International Cricket Stadium in Lahore, Pakistan was the site of the final for the 1996 ICC World Cup. Despite it being a neutral venue, there was no doubt that Sri Lanka had been adopted as the home site for that match. They won the toss and fielded first, which raised a few eyebrows because up until that point, no team had won the World Cup batting last. It was yet another moment that showed Sri Lanka would always do things their way. Australia opened with Mark Taylor and Mark Waugh. Mark Waugh was the second highest run scorer of the tournament so far. And when he got out for 12 early in the innings, Sri Lanka had drawn first blood. There was plenty of batting talent to come though. Ricky Ponting came in next and together with Mark Taylor, Australia's lead started to grow quickly, even on a slow and spin friendly track. Despite the soon to be 100 run partnership, Arjuna stuck to his process and kept cycling through his spin options, throwing the ball to his fourth spinner of the day, Aravinda De Silva, and he got the breakthrough. In the air. And it's gone, he's got it. One wicket became two four overs later. De Silva gets both set batters and it was three for 152. Interestingly, Mark Taylor brings on Shane Warne up the order as a pinch hitter but his eternal bowling rival, Utai Muralithran, makes short work of him. With wickets falling and the regular use of spin options in these helpful conditions, Australia were finding it hard to really accelerate when they needed to. In these middle overs, it was hard enough to stay at the crease. Steve Waugh was out soon for 13 and Sri Lanka had the Aussies on the back foot. This would eventually help them to keep a lid on the score in the end. The last four batters led by Michael Bevan would put on 73 runs between them setting Sri Lanka a total of 241 to win. This was another example of Arjuna Ranatunga and his quartet of spin options imposing their game plan on the opposition. Australia were on their way to the high 200s, but the spin bowling in the middle overs brought it back to a much more manageable total. Still though, 241 for a team like Australia might have been enough for them to defend on most occasions in the past. But what the Sri Lankans had done through their batting in this World Cup is that they started to push the boundaries of what teams thought of as enough runs to win. Remember, they comfortably chased down 271 in one match and put on 398 runs in another. Looking at it from that perspective, 241 runs didn't seem enough. Walking out to the crease to win the World Cup, Sri Lanka's openers knew their job, even as Glenn McGrath was staring daggers at them waiting to bowl. They would have wanted a repeat of their group match against India. Unfortunately though, it was more like their semi-final. The third man is quite wide. On oh, he's going again. He could be dead here. And he has given him out. Well, that's in the air. This is going to be out. Yes, he's got him. That's out court. He's gone for the pull shot. That's very well bowled. Despite two boundaries in the first over, both openers were out cheaply. At 2 for 23, Asanka Gurusinghe and Aravinda De Silva are at the crease. Let's put ourselves in their position for a second. This is maybe the biggest game of your life and arguably the biggest in the history of your country. Standing all around you are the same team that not only refused to play in your country a short time ago, but beat you comfortably a couple of months earlier, including at a stadium where a teammate of yours was treated so poorly. With these things in the background in a World Cup pressure cooker situation, I don't know how they did what they did next. As cool as a Zen master, these two start playing shot after shot after shot, splitting fields to the boundary and sometimes just going over their head. Guru Singer brings up his 50, followed shortly by De Silva off 50 balls. A 100 run partnership is soon formed. Australia's trying anything at this point. Seven different players are given the ball, but these two seem impervious, even with this delivery. He's hit that in the air, this will be out court. Yes, he's gone. Oh, he's dropped it, I don't believe it. Stuart Law's down there, that's got to be the World Cup gone. That was a straightforward lollipop catch. Have a look at this. Well. <laughs> Tony Gregg always had a great way with words. 
everything's going their way until the 30th over when the Aussies finally get the wicket they needed. Is it too late though? 94 runs are needed off 188 balls. And the next batter up is not just anyone, it's Arjuna Ranatunga. Sri Lanka's two most senior batters are at the crease and it was their time to bring it home. As the overs ticked away, Australia's chances were getting smaller and smaller. Aravinda brings up his century in a masterpiece of an innings. That's a great century. A great century made when the chips were down by a fantastic batsman. Funnily enough, for all the hype around their attacking batting throughout the tournament, it was the level-headed approach of these two that would seal it for Sri Lanka. And with a nonchalant flick to the third man boundary, Arjuna Ranatunga, the captain that nurtured this side from his family dinner table in Colombo, the one who stood side by side with Murali at the MCG, and the one who guided his team through this tournament, was the one who scored the winning runs. Sri Lanka had won the World Cup. For these players and a nation that had been through a lot, this was amazing. It's hard to overstate how important that this victory was for not only Sri Lanka, but for international cricket as a whole. There are so many questions that go around in my head watching this back. Without Jaya Surya and Kalawatharana, would we have seen Hayden and Gilchrist, Savag and Tendulkar, Roy and Bairstow? Without Sri Lanka's blazing attacking batting guiding the way, would we have even seen the 438 game at the Wanderers in 2006? That's why to me, this Sri Lankan team and this World Cup is such a massive deal. In my opinion, the way they played and the records they created steered the course of how international limited overs cricket would evolve in the following years. It created a paradigm shift in how the game could be played that would eventually shape the T20 format. It heralded the arrival of Sri Lanka as a juggernaut of international one day cricket. And for a small but oh so important island nation, it's when they truly found their roar. G'day guys. Thanks for making it to the end of the video. I hope you enjoyed it. So much so that you would hit the like button and share it with someone that you think would like it also. I know I sound like a broken record, but this is the first video I've made since we hit 10,000 subscribers. And your support in these small ways is the main reason why we hit this massive milestone. So truly, thank you from the bottom of my heart. For all the new viewers out there, I hope you consider subscribing also. And on screen now, is another video that marked a turning point in cricketing history that you might like also. And until the next one, take care and I'll see you soon.